this mortgage bond. Then you must make your mortgage bond specifically subject there to. So you'll say subject to the conditions contained in the aforesaid title deed, more specifically subject to a usufruct in favor of X, Y, Z, identity number status, lifelong, or a lease agreement for 30 years in favor of so-and-so, or a fiducomissum in favor of so-and-so. So you will set out that condition. But, and this is where the trick now comes in. A financial institution will not afford you a mortgage bond and rank subsequent to the rights of a fiducomissary or a lessee or a, 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 sorry, yeah, a, a, the, the lease over the property or a usufruct uses habitatio. So you will make it subject there too, but they will require you to draft the necessary documentation to draft the necessary documentation that where there's a waiver of preference in favor of the bond in your mortgage bond. Now, and, and, and many of you that have these notes, there's one, I've, 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 I've realized that there was one mistake in his mortgage, in his notes, where they asked you to draft the necessary document for purposes of the waiver. And then I think in his notes, he draft a waiver. That's not what the examiners want. The examiners want you to draft the property description referring to, and I'm going to give this, well, it's it's in my notes as well, and it's in Javi's notes, uh, uh, subject to the conditions contained in the aforesaid title, more specifically subject to a usufruct in favor of XYZ identity number status, of which usufruct is, has been waived, as will more fully be set out year in after. Then just in, before you're in witness clause, you say, and also appeared before me, the name of the conveyancer, the, then the use of fracturies name, identity number status by virtue of a power of attorney, on, given that at Pretoria on such and such a date, and whereas the usufructuary declare, whereas the peerage principle declared as follows, that she waives a usufruct that in favor of the bond, this bond, uh, should the property be sold in execution or insolvency, it can be sold free from this usufruct. There is a, there's a, 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 a situation that you have to set out in your mortgage bond. If they ask you to draft the document that is going to be prepared, pre that is going to be signed by the use of fracture or lessee, that is the power of attorney that is given to the conveyancer to appear before the registrar of deeds to waive this use of fracture, use of habitatio, or or lease, or whatever the case may be. So if, if I, and now I'm speaking from personally, don't once again quote me or, 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 or take this as the gospel. If I have to prepare something for the exams, I'm going to prepare this property description with a waiver and maybe the waiver in the mortgage bond and or the uh, power of attorney that is signed by the holder of this real right to waive preference in favor of the bond. Those of you that have got my book, yes, I have set it out and I've given you examples in my book and I'm sure Harvey LaRue's notes as a full exposition of this waiver of the UC fract. But watch out now, don't draft the consent to waiver because there's no such thing as a consent to waiver. It is a act of registration that takes place. It is not a consent. It is, it is a waiver. It's either a power of attorney or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the aspect that you set out in your mortgage bond. Um, the supporting documents of the mortgage bond, ladies and gentlemen, I, I cannot tell you what supporting documents. It's usually the power of attorney. They, they, they love asking this in the oral. And, and remember, you're not going to get an oral. They ask you, what supporting documents will you lodge with a sectional mortgage bond? Now, we're going to get to that. And how many people say a power of attorney? There's no power of attorney lodged with a sectional mortgage bond because it is executed by the conveyancer before the registrar of deeds. With a conventional bond, yes, there is a power of attorney and there are certain consents that must be lodged. So once again, the, the mortgage bond, the supporting documents, the drafting of the mortgage bond, the drafting of the clauses in the mortgage bond, yes, you must have a working knowledge of that. As I said, the preparation clause, the preamble, the acknowledgement clause, the mortgagee, let us just look at the amount. 
do you think that the amount of a mortgage bond can be can be expressed in a foreign currency? Yes, it can. If I am lend, if I'm borrowing from you 500 million euros, I can register a mortgage bond for 500 million euros. But at registration, you have to give the register of deeds a forex, a exchange rate of that, because he will uh, calculate his registration fee on the exchange rate as at date of registration. So the morning on prep, you will give him the exchange rate that will be lodged as a supporting document. And that is what your registration fee is going to be calculated on. So yes, it can be expressed in a foreign currency. The cause of the mortgage bond, uh, the, 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 the only thing that you cannot have a cause of four is that it cannot be contra bonus mortis. So for anything else, money lent and advanced, uh, money lent and to be advanced, balance of purchase price, goods sold and delivered, and, and so I can continue with the causa. Uh, there's no art in preparing the causa of a mortgage bond. The cost clause, now the cost clause, and, and when you are practicing as a conveyancer, and you have to have the, the mortgage bond signed by the parties because it has to be signed before a, a conveyancer. The first thing that the people ask, they ask, what is this cost clause? Why is this cost clause in the mortgage bond? And, 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 and I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't borrow that amount of money. Usually it's 25% of the amount loaned. And then you must explain to them the cost clause or the purpose, because this has also been asked in the exams in the past. The purpose of a cost clause is to cover the incidental debts that is going to be incurred should foreclosure take place. The insurance of the property, the sheriff's fees, etc., etc., etc. So, and obviously the interest, because if I, if you borrow a hundred thousand rand from me today, your payment is only going to be payable next month, and then the interest has already incurred. And then if you stop paying, I have to get my hundred thousand rand back plus that interest plus the share of fees. So that is what the 25% or the cost clause is for purposes of the mortgage bond. Now, trying to explain to the man or woman in the street what the purpose of a cost clause is, and, and I can tell you, nine out of 10 times she says, no, I'm not signing this document because I didn't borrow that amount of money. And why am I not getting that amount of money? And then you must try and explain this to the parties. The security clause, I've already said, that, you will, uh, that will be the property description the special condition clause will be the uh, conditions in terms of regulation 41.1, read together with regulation 41.7, and then the waiver of preference, which I'm spotting for this exam, the waiver of preference of a real right in favor of the bond. Candidates must be capable of drafting the waiver to be included in the mortgage bonds on ground special power of attorney afforded to the peer to waive the real right in favor of the bond. So you must be able to prepare that power of attorney as well as the clause that you're going to put in after your uh, special condition clause. Then we come to the supporting documents. As I said, the power of attorney, the power of attorney, and the, co uh, the consents for title conditions. But what, what we, I don't know, does this, is, yes, then the different types of mortgage bonds. Now, this has been, strangely enough, I'm going to give my age away, but in 1982, when I wrote the conveyancing exam, they asked us to prepare a surety bond. But, but remember, in 1982, we didn't get the prescribed forms. We had to study that all the prescribed forms like a parrot off by heart. And in those days, we were compelled to do an oral as well. And uh, I got the oral. And the first question they asked me, they asked me, why didn't you answer the question on the surety bond? And I, I had to say, I didn't study the prescribed form. I could identify that it was a surety bond, but if you have to study or you have to recite that whole surety bond, because remember, it must be substantially in the prescribed form. And it was only for 10 marks in those days because we only wrote a 100 mark paper. Uh, I just said to them, I didn't have time. And then they started grinding me on surety bonds, obviously. So once again, yes, they can ask you, they can give you a scenario and say, draft the necessary bond up until the conditional clause. 
So what they want you to be able to ascertain or determine from you, can you differentiate between a collateral bond and a surety bond? Now, guys, I'm, I'm not underestimating your intelligence, but I've, I've, I've seen so many people have a major trying to distinguish between a collateral bond and a surety bond. A collateral bond is an additional bond given by the same mortgage or in favor of the same mortgage, giving additional additional uh, uh, security. So same mortgage or same mortgage, same mortgage additional security. Guys, just, uh, somebody came in now and put his mic on. Just put off your mics, please, man. And a surety bond is obviously additional security given by a third party. The amount can never be more than the initial amount or the, 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 the principal debt. So that is actually the difference between a collateral bond and a surety bond. A Kistings brief I've already touched on, and there I want you just as well, when looking at the Kistings brief, I want you to look at the provisions of section 87 to 89 of the Insolvency Act, because that is those sections that afford that security that the Kistings brief gives a mortgagee when a Kistings brief or bond for the, for the balance of purchase price is registered over a person's property. The indemnity bond, if I can just go on, sorry, the indemnity bond, you'll see I didn't even, I'm not going to, if I were you, I'm not studying the indemnity bond, I'm not studying the debenture bond. The participation mortgage bond, they can ask you something in the sense of short questions. They won't ask you to prepare a participation mortgage bond, but everything that's, that governs participation mortgage bonds. I always try and equate a participation mortgage bond with a stock fail because it's nothing more or nothing less than actually a stock fail because it is a nominee company where everybody uh, puts their money into this kitty and then the mortgage bond is afforded and those people that have allocated their money to the kitty gets real rights in this property. I refer you to CRC 15 and 21 of 2003, as well as 4 of 2012, which relates to the Collective Investment Schemes Control Act 45 of 2002. You'll see those are, that's one of the acts that has been prescribed for you in your syllabus. But I say to you, don't study the act, just study that circular. Just study the circular 15 and 21 of 2003, because that tells you everything about the Collective Schemes Act and what you have to know. Can it be seeded? If it's seeded, with whose consent? Is there a minimum amount? In whose name is the mortgage bond registered? Those short questions that you could be requested to answer on participation mortgage bonds. A covering bond, my, my colleague says to me, you've missed a covering bond. Now, they can actually only ask you what is a covering bond. And it's very important that you do know, because when we come to part payments, and the reductions of cover, you must know the difference between a covering bond and a fixed bond. A covering bond is registered for a debt that is not in existence or is not fully in existence at the time of registration of the mortgage bond. For instance, money lent and advanced and to be advanced. I also say, you know, a, a covering, the, the majority of our Financial institution bonds are covering bonds, and it has a covering security clause that you can advance future debt, uh, 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 future amounts to the maximum amount of the capital amount. But you try that, except if you've got a what, what we call a uh, access bond. But I, I don't know if we do get access bonds anymore, where you can use your credit card and 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 draw money on your mortgage bond. So the, as you pay off. So it reduces and then you can ad get advances to the capital amount. So your, what a covering bond is, it is a bond where the amount is not stagnant, but it can fluctuate. But with a fixed mortgage bond, you get money lent in advance for 100,000 rand and then you pay off and pay off and pay off. Till no, you cannot, it cannot fluctuate. So just know that there is a difference between a covering bond and a fixed mortgage bond for purposes of when we get to dealings with mortgage bonds, when we're going to do the cover reduced and the part payment. 
Substitutions of debtors. Guys, we've already done section 24 bis 3. Can you remember what form we're going to use for 24 bis 3? And remember 24 bis 2 is when the partnership dissolves and we bring an application that the property now vests in all the individual partners or of it's an estate, the estate, or whatever the case may be. And if there's a mortgage bond, that they will then be substituted as debtors in their individual capacities, and they will have to waive the legal exception. Can anybody think of the legal exception that they're now going to waive? They dobius, vel pluribus, raise the bendy, that they will be jointly and severally uh, bound in solidium. Uh, as such, not that they were not bound when they were parties uh, in terms of or, or partners in the partnership, because remember, a partnership is not an individual. It, it creates the impression that it is. We did the substitutions in terms of section 45. We looked at prescribed form T there, and we looked at prescribed form triple B, if you can remember, for the capital A one. So that shouldn't be a problem. Then we come to a very, 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 very important one. And this one I'm also spotting for the exams. And that is the substitution of debt in terms of section 57. Now, I see it and I've been seeing it for more than 40 years that senior conveyances still don't know when to do a substitution of debt in terms of section 45 and when to do it in terms of section 57. The substitutions in terms of section 45 can only be done if the transfer is effected in terms of an endorsement. If I transfer my, let me by way of an example, I, I'm the owner of a property and I have a mortgage bond over the property and I sell the property to you, not for the full purchase price, for a, an amount and you must take over the liability under the mortgage bond, then you can be substituted under that mortgage bond in terms of section 57. Not that the financial institutions like this. I don't know why. I don't know if conveyances told them it's not a good idea because you don't get the full conveyancing fee. I don't know why, but they don't like doing section 57 for the balance of the purchase price of a property. However, Section 57, I say, can only take place if you are affecting the transfer by a formal deed of transfer. And at this point in time, as conference holds it, until the Act gets amended, you can also substitute a share. What I mean by that is if A, B, and C are the co... No, let me just make it easier. A and B are the owners of a property. My wife and I are the owners of a property we married out of community of property. We get divorced and I say, wife, you take over the property and you take over the mortgage bond. And she says, shop. What happens then is the transfer gets effected of the half share to her and she can be substituted in, as debtor for the full mortgage bond in terms of section 57. But if we were married in community of property, it would have been a section 45, do you agree with me? And then we couldn't do a section 57, we would have had to do a section 45 to C. The other aspect that you have to understand under the provisions of section 57, the section 57 of the Deeds Registries Act, which you're going to have with you when writing the first, with the second paper, but not with the first paper, tells you that there are certain cases that section 57 cannot be applied. If it's a surety bond, it says, if you're not transferring the whole of the property, if you are reserving a, a real right, like a usufruct, usus and habitatia, and I think there's one or other uh, as well, which I cannot think of now. But I will advise you to go and study section 57. And looking at section 57, now I must... Pre I've identified that I am going to do a substitution of debt in terms of section 57. Is there a prescribed form? Yes, there's a prescribed form W. And it is an application and it is a consent. So it's an application by the person and it is a consent by the financial institution. Now, here once again, where, where you've identified the prescribed form. All that you now have to do is rewrite the prescribed form. But guys, you can't believe it. When you're referring 
to the mortgagee. You have to refer to so-and-so in his capacity as the official of the ABC Bank. Registration number, the full registration number, duly authorized by virtue of a, 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 a resolution, and then set it out. People just say the ABC Bank. And what's going to happen if you only say the ABC Bank and it's lodged at the deeds office? You're going to be rejected. So 50% of your marks is because you just made that one stupid mistake. But you're not going to make those mistakes in the exams because you know exactly how to prepare a section 57 now. But it comes with practice. So when you are preparing a section 57, close your books, take the form, write it out, and then check yourself. It is so important that you continually check yourself or give it to a colleague to check and ask your colleague, please tell me, would you have accepted this being an examiner in the deeds office? So, yes, that is our substitutions of debtors. So we've now done the mortgage bond. We've done the different kinds of mortgage bonds. We've done, uh, we've completed the waiver of preference. Remember the power of attorney. You might be asking me, can we be required to prepare a power of attorney for a mortgage bond? No, because usually the, the, the power of attorney is a one clauser with a draft power of attorney attached to it. So they won't ask you to prepare the power of attorney of a mortgage bond. The power of attorney for the, uh, for the, the waiver of preference, yes. The substitution of debt in terms of Section 24 bis 3, I don't have to go through that again. We've already done that when we did the transfer by endorsement in terms of Section 24 bis 2. Substitutions in terms of Section 45 2C, don't have to go through that. We are spotting that in any case, because remember, that is a cost-effective manner. They will tell you in the question that the bond must not be cancelled and it must be dealt with in the most cost-effective manner then obviously you know that they want you to do a substitution of data. Substitution of data in terms of Section 57, I said candidates must be capable of drafting the substitution by using prescribed form W and have a sound knowledge of the contents of Section 57. Right, then we come to dealings with mortgage bonds. So once again, we've now done the mortgage bond, and, and, and maybe you, you, you're thinking now, that how, Alan, you're making it so simplistic. It is so simplistic. As I said, when we come to sectional mortgage bonds, that's something different. But the conventional mortgage bonds, it is the clauses that you have to have a knowledge of. You have to be able to differentiate between the types of mortgage bonds and then, obviously, the substitutions of debtors. Now, let us look at dealings with mortgage bonds. The first one is the cancellation of the mortgage bond. Are they ever going to ask you to draft the cancellation of a mortgage bond? No. They will ask you under what circumstances is it not necessary to, to lodge a bond for cancellation in the deeds office. And there you have to go back to Section 56 of our Deeds Registries Act. There it tells you if you're selling the property in execution, if it's an expropriation transfer, if it's a sale by deceased insolvent estate, if it's an insolvent estate, and NB, 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 remember these words. They'll ask you, if a company has been liquidated, must the bonds be lodged for disposal or cancellation? Now, let us uh, think of that question now. I ask the question again. You are dealing with a company that has been liquidated. Must the bonds, when the property is transferred by the liquidator to whoever has bought the property, must the bonds be lodged for cancellation at the deeds office? What does Section 56 of our Deeds Registries Act say? It says, the bonds need not have to be lodged for disposal if the company has been legally liquidated and is unable to pay its debts. Meaning that, remember, there's different ways of a company being liquidated. It can be li voluntarily liquidated by its directors, and I would love to have a property registered in my name and voluntarily liquidated, and then I don't have to pay my mortgage bond. I mean, that's not going to happen. So obviously you'll have to, or it can be legally li liquidated by, by the creditors, but it can still pay its, its debts, then the bonds have to be lodged, or liquidated by order of court and cannot pay its debts. And how, how, and this is the question that they ask you, how is the deeds office 
going to know that this company has been legally liquidated and I'm unable to pay its debts. Yes, there will be a liquidation order, but how do we know that the company cannot pay its debts? The liquidator must give the registrar an affidavit to say that the company is unable to pay its debts. And sometimes they ask you to prepare this affidavit. Guys, you are all qualified attorneys or almost qualified attorneys or whatever, you can prepare an affidavit, surely. So I don't have to go into that, but I'm, I, I'm sure even Harvey LaRue's notes has it in. So the cancellation of mortgage bonds shouldn't be a problem. But while I'm on cancellation of mortgage bonds, I want to touch on the cancellation of a lost mortgage bond. Now, remember, if your mortgage bond has been lost, you don't have to get a certified copy of that mortgage bond to cancel that mortgage bond. You cancel that mortgage bond in terms of a consent and affidavit in terms of regulation 6811 of the Deeds Registries Act. And how many people phone me and ask me and email me, must I advertise this? No, you don't advertise for a 6811. You only advertise for a regulation 681. This is an affidavit and consent, you, you will use prescribed form MM, but you will declare under oath that the mortgage bond has been lost, that it has not been pledged or held as security by anybody, that you apply to the register of these in terms of regulation 6811 for the cancellation of the mortgage bond. So know how to prepare a 6811, not the normal cancellation, because that is just prescribed form MM. The release of property from a mortgage bond, Section 55 and Section 66. This is the instance where, and, and usually it happens when you're taking out a certificate of registered title or you're transferring a portion of your property and you only, you don't want to cancel the mortgage bond, but you want to release. And the bondholder says, you know, the security that is left under this bond is sufficient for purposes of the debt that is owed, then they will consent to the release of a property. It will be an earth or it will be portion one measuring so and so as will more fully appear from that diagram. So a release from the mortgage bond should not cause any problems for you. A waiver of preference. Now, don't confuse this waiver of preference with a waiver of preference that we dealt with of the waiver of preference of a real right in favor of the bond. This is the waiver of preference so that one bond can rank prior to another bond or that one bond can rank pari pursu with another bond on equal footing. And remember now with a waiver of preference as well, it is not a consent. It is not a consent. It is an act of registration. You will use form MM, but your heading will be not consent to waiver of preference, it will be waiver of preference. Your operative clause, and you know, I don't, once again, we, we haven't actually got time, but the operative clause will be, do hereby waive all my right title and interest and preference in favor of a bond about to be registered in favor of so-and-so for an amount of so-and-so, or do hereby waive my preference of a bond to be registered in favor and so and so, so that that bond ranks pari pursue with this bond. It's as easy as that. The, the, that's the only thing that differs in all of these consents. The consent to cancellation, the consent to release, the consent to waiver preference is your operative clause. In all other instances, you're going to use form MM. While I'm thinking of form MM, I usually tell candidates, remember if there's not a prescribed form, other than you use MM. If there's not a specific prescribed form, you're going to use MM. Session of a mortgage bond. I'm spotting this for the exams as well. Why? I don't know. I just get this feeling. Remember, I've been lecturing conveyancing to conveyances since 1984. And I, I, I sometimes, remember the exam paper hasn't been prepared, so I'm not giving you tips. I, I'm just saying I, I just sometimes get a feeling that it's now time for a session of a mortgage bond again. Um, and, and once again, what, what, is, what is funny with a session of a mortgage bond? You're going to use form MM, and your operative clause is going to be to hereby cede all my right title and interest in the above mortgage bond to so-and-so, and then you must be able to differentiate between an out-and-out session and a session as security. 
let me just try and explain to you the difference between an out and out session and a session in security. An out and out session is where the mortgagee falls out of the picture totally. He actually sells it or he bequeaths it or he exchanges it or it is inherited or whatever the case may be and he's out of the picture. Whereas a session as security, you only give it to somebody to hold as security for a debt. And once that debt is paid, the session must be cancelled and the mortgage bond is then in favour only of the mortgagee again. But it's once again your operative clause. You're going to use form MM. Let, this, let me, by way of an example again, say to you, I die. And the only asset that I have in my estate, remember now, People confuse when I say the only asset that I have in my estate is a mortgage bond that I have registered over somebody else's property for a debt that they owed me. So that is my asset. I'm the mortgagee of a bond over somebody else's property. That's my only asset. Obviously, it is a real right. And I die and I say I bequeath all my assets to my children, subject to a usufruct in favor of my wife. Draft a necessary document to afford the asset to the persons that are entitled there to. To whom are you going to see this mortgage bond? I say, in my will, I say, I bequeath all my earthly belongings to my children, subject to a usufruct in favor of my wife. You're going to see this. You're going to say, you hereby cede all my right title and interest in the above mortgage, in the above mortgage bond to Erna West, identity number, as, status as use of Stop there. In terms of a will of so-and-so who passed away on such and such a day. When Erna dies, her estate must cede that to the is that are entitled to it because she is going to be entitled to the fruits of this mortgage bond and what are the fruits of the mortgage bond the interest that is the fruits she's going to be entitled there to as use of until the day she dies and only then is it seeded and that is where the trick question comes in to whom must you seed the mortgage bond is it the out and out session is the session a security is the session only to a use of you have to determine who you're going to. If it's a session as security, your causa is seed all my right title and interest in the above mortgage bond to so and so as security. Stop. Let us say I have a mortgage bond and that mortgage, I, 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 um, the sheriff forecloses on that mortgage bond. How, who, who's going to seed that mortgage bond? And um, let's say, and, and that mortgage bond is sold in execution. Who's going to seed the mortgage bond? The sheriff. As you would do with a sheriff transfer, the sheriff, cited as so and so, seeds all the right title and interest in so and so mortgage bond to so and so in terms of a writ of execution, whereby so and so was the plaintiff, so and so was the defendant, and it was sold on such and such a date. So your causa in your session will be the same as your causa in your foreclosure sheriff transfer of a deed of transfer. I hope that answers your question. So what I'm saying to you, the only thing with session is no, session as security, session out and out, and the causes that is applicable. And one subtle nuance as well is, when must the mortgage jaw consent? When must the mortgage jaw consent to the session of a mortgage bond? Only when the full amount is not ceded or when it is ceded to more than one person. When the full amount is not ceded or when it is not ceded to, if it's ceded to more than one person. Okay? Variation of the terms of a bond. In the, in the first paper, which is the short questions, they might, might ask you which mortgage, uh, under what circumstance or 
what terms of a mortgage bond cannot be varied in terms of Section 31S of the Deeds Registries Act. That is obviously, you cannot uh, vary the cost clause, you cannot vary the security clause, you cannot vary the amount of the bond, and those are the aspects that cannot be varied. So that you have to study. The, the drafting the variation agreement it is like falling off your chair because there is prescribed form VV. You just describe the mortgagee and the mortgagee and you say that they agreed on such and such a date to change the interest rate from 12% to 15% now therefore and that is form VV. So that should not be a problem. Then we come to part payments and cover reduced. Once again, yeah. once again in the short questions they might ask you, when are you going to register part payment? When are you going to register cover reduced? You will register part payment if the mortgage or has paid off a certain amount of a bond which was registered for a fixed amount. And once again, form MM, do hereby, and this is a consent, do hereby consent to the amount of the bond being reduced from 500,000 to 300,000. Okay? Or do hereby consent to the, the amount of the bond, the cover afforded under the bond to be reduced from 500,000 to 300,000 if it is a covering bond, if it is not a fixed bond. So that is that is the difference between a part payment and a cover reduced. Usually, ladies and gentlemen, when I am being substituted as debtor, I don't want to be substituted as debtor in a fixed bond for the full amount if the full amount is not owing. So I will first do a part payment or a cover reduced or if I'm ceding the bond to you and the full amount is not owing under the mortgage bond, I wouldn't say, you can't cede the full amount to me because the, then you're going to give me security for a million rand, whereas the bond is only, so you will do a cover reduced or a part payment. So in certain instances, it is not per entry, but it is expected that you will do a part payment or a cover reduced. The consents to issuing of certificates of consolidated title and certificates of registered title and partition transfers. We've done the partition transfers. I'm not going to do the consents for consolidated and certificates of registered title now because we're going to do it when we do the certificates of registered title, which is coming up very soon. That is dealings with mortgage bonds. So if you can ask me, what can I expect under dealings with mortgage bonds? Very difficult because form MM, form VV, form W, I mean, there we've got it. We've got the forms. We must just know when to prepare what. But there you've got the forms in front of you. This should not be rocket science, okay? Um, and I, I trust that you, if, if you look at my book, if you look at Harvey Leroux's notes, if you look at the notes that you've got from LEED, it sets out in all these circumstances and you've got the forms in front of you. We now come to sundry applications for the endorsement of a title deed of a mo of immovable property or mortgage bond. Now, this is when you guys said, yes, but there's another, another nine. This is the other nine. But this is not transfers by endorsement. This is sundry applications. And the first one we're going to deal with is section 41B. Now, any conveyancer, that practices conveyancing, even advocates know about Section 41B. But I, I'll never forget, I was one day in the deeds office and uh, a, a, an assistant registrar said to me, I was, I was an examiner at that point in time and I was actually a pain in the backside because I was, I was really very finicky. And he said, Alan, I don't know why you're so finicky, you know, there's nothing that a Section 41B can't fix. So, yes, that, 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 that's the wrong attitude that the conveyance or anybody should have because the Section 41B has actually a limited application. It says you can amend the name of the person, the description of the person, the description of the property, and the conditions. It has been expanded even to amend the uh, causa, it has been uh, uh, expanded to uh, amend the um, the earth numbers if it was an error in registration or even the purchase price if it does not influence the transfer duty. But an application and affidavit in terms of section 41B 
gets brought by the holder of the title deed. It can also be brought by a conveyancer acting in terms of a power of attorney. But certain aspects that, and, and guys, it is so important because remember, I say once again, you've got the act in front of you when you're preparing a section 41B. You're, you must declare under oath that there was an error, that the correct situation is this, that this error will not have the effect of transferring a real right, that this is the only deed that needs to be amended, and then um, you apply to the Register of Deeds for the rectification of that title deed or mortgage bond. You can, you can bring one application affidavit for numerous deeds. If you've got a mortgage bond and you've got an anti-nuptial contract and you've got a deed of transfer and you've got a deed of servitude, all having the same, you can bring one application to amend them all. So Section 41B, it hasn't been asked often. It was, I think if I go back into the old exam papers, I can't remember if it was asked more than twice. So Section 41B, know the difference between Section 41B and Section 17.4 because confused Section 17.4 with 41B. And by way of an example again, I buy my property before registration takes place. I get married out of community of property. But I didn't tell the conveyancer, so the conveyancer cites me as unmarried in my title deed. After delivery of my title deed, I go back to the conveyancer and say, uh -uh, my, my status is wrong in my title deed, fix it up. He says, okay, we'll bring a section 41B. Is that correct or must I bring a section 17.4? What's the difference between section 41B and 17.4? 41B was an error in registration. So I cannot bring a section 17.4. A section 17.4 will be brought if I change my status not change, yeah, if my cha status changes after registration, I get married in community of property, I get married out of community of property, I divorce, I get married in terms of a foreign marriage, or I get married in terms of a customary marriage, or I, my, my customary marriage wasn't, remember, it wasn't recognized before the 15th of October 2000, still described as unmarried, which was actually right at that point in time, but incorrect now because the act says you can update it. So section 17.4 is to update your title deed after your status has changed. But let, let me just, by way of an example again, I am married in community of property. Um, I get divorced. And now I say to you, update my title deed with my status, please, because I'm a divorce now. Can I use section 17.4? Can I use section 17.4 if I'm divorced um, or my wife dies and I ask you to update my title deed, but I was married in community of property? No, because that th there's a transfer that must take place. I must obtain my share of my wife or my wife must obtain her share in the property. So you'll have to do a section 45 or a section 45 bis. It's only if I'm married out of community of property and I then want my state, and for the hell of me, I would not know why if I was married out of community of property, I want my status to be unmarried uh, because it will still be, it will just be an endorsement on the title deed. But if your client wants it, we're going to charge him a thousand seven hundred rand for it. Hallelujah. But I usually say, and, and we, we get conveyances. I, and I, as a correspondent, I get it. Now, then I see here's a section 17.4 coming in with a transfer of the property. And I say, why? He says, no, the client wants it. But your title's going dead. Yeah, my client wants it. I say, fine, we'll do it. But it's not peremptory. Right, that is 17.4. 25.3. Guys, I've been dealing with conveyancing, as I said, since 1972. In practice. I have never, ever, ever come across a section 25.3. Now, section 25.3, to explain this to you, I have to explain section 25 of the Deeds Registries Act. Section 25 says that if somebody dies or somebody um, donates property or bequeaths property to the children born or to be born from a person 
or from a marriage. So I, I want to, I actually want to rule from the grave. And, or, uh, so I'm saying to you, I'm going to bequeath this property to the children born or to be born from my son. Then that property will be registered in the, my son's name in trust for the children born or to be born from him. So it will be registered in Jared West in trust for the children born or to be born from him. If it's from a marriage, it will be registered in Jared West and Joyce West as the natural guardians for the children born or to be born from their marriage. They, as I said, I've never seen it, but that's that's the background to this. Now, when those children are ascertained, then we have to bring an application to endorse the title deed to vest that property in the children that have been ascertained by them. Now, the question is, I'm posing this question to you, if I bequeath my property to the children born or to be born from Jared West. When will those children be ascertained? When they, my colleague says when they're born. When are they finished being born? When can Jared no longer procreate? When he's, when he's dead. Or in terms of an order of court. If it's a woman, Obviously, as well, not after she's had a hysterectomy, no. Only a court of law or a death will guarantee that those children are ascertained. And then those children or their representatives will bring an application to the Registrar of Deeds to endorse the title deed by virtue of the fact of the death or the order of court that the children are now ascertained and the property vests in A, B, C, D. If it's Bequeathed to the children born or to be born from a marriage between Joyce and um, Jared West. When are those children ascertained? On either the death of Jared or the death of Joyce or order of court. Not on the divorce. We've already had that. Let us just divorce and then the children are ascertained. No, because they can remarry again. So once again, only on the death of either of them or on by virtue of an order of court. Those children are ascertained, you will bring the application. I've given you examples of how the application must read in, in, in uh, uh, you know, the drafting of the application. For all these applications that we're looking at now, there's no prescribed form. But like a section 45, I like to follow a format because I can follow the format for all of them. Once again, preparation clause, Heading? Heading is just application. If it's an application and affidavit, you say application and affidavit. Then you say, I, who's going to bring it? Then you're going to say, do you by apply to the Registrar of Deeds for the endorsement of the title deed in terms of Section 17.4 or 25.3 or whatever the case may, to the effect. And then you set it out. And then it is signed. It does not have to be signed before witnesses. If it's an affidavit, uh, you, and here's a tip. Don't sit writing out that long clause of an affidavit. You make a little star and you say, I'll complete this in the form of an affidavit. Full marks, you'll get your full marks for it. But people sometimes sit there and they write out every affidavit. They write out a hell of a long affidavit clause. You're not going to finish your paper if you do that. So that's 25.3. Section 44 is the resurvey of property. Now, I've... I've, I've seen this question in the exams and many people confuse section 44 with section 41d what happens in practice is i buy a piece of property and i ask my seller to tell me where are the beacons of this property and he says you know what it, during the boer war they used to take the barrels of guns and they used to put it in cement and those and that is that has obviously disintegrated. So I don't know where the boundaries of my land is. And I say, okay, in that case, I want, because I must know because I'm going to put up walls or I'm going to put up fences. I want to get out the surveyor and the surveyor will then do what we call a resurvey of the property. And if the resurvey differs from the existing 
survive because remember nowadays we have very advanced manners of surveying property they used to survey property by riding it with a horse an hour this way and an hour that way and then put in pegs that doesn't happen anymore we we have advanced things to survey property if it doesn't correlate with the existing diagram new diagrams are uh, uh, procured for that property and those diagrams substitute the old diagrams and then you have to bring an application in terms of section 44 not for the rectification of the title deed or but for the substitution of the one diagram for the other diagram where the, the extent of the property is no longer x but it is now y so once again Look at the difference between, I uh, say, 41B, 174, and 44. They are updating the title deed every time. And yes, there is something wrong in the title deed, but it wasn't an error in registration. This is a resurvey of the property. This is an update of, of status after. So please note on that. Then section 58.2. Um, this is this section 58.1 and section 58.2 is a very difficult aspect to understand from a conveyancing point of view you have to understand the insolvency act first of all we know that if i'm declared insolvent i stay insolvent for a period of 10 years after 10 years i'm automatically uh, rehabilitated in terms of section 127 capital a of the insolvency act and all properties of which i was divested during my insolvency revests in me automatically and the, the the sequestration order that's noted against my name in the deeds office disappears they take it off nobody will ever know that i was sequestrated after 10 years but before the lapse of 10 years i can apply to court to have myself rehabilitated because remember once i'm declared insolvent i'm divested of all my assets and in whom does my assets then vest? In my trustee or curator. If I'm rehabilitated, it doesn't automatically revest in me. The trustee or curator must give it back to me. How does he give it back to me? In terms of section 58.1, it can be transferred by the master or the trustee back to me in terms of a formal deed of transfer if I have been reinvested, and this is not my word, this is the word of the insolvent, if I've been reinvested with the property in terms of the order of court. However, section 58.2 says, if there was a compromise entered into, a compromise entered into between the creditors and the insolvent and rehabilitation occurs, then the transfer back of the property in terms of this composition as they call it will take place by virtue of an endorsement where either the trustee can bring it or the rehabilitated insolvent can bring it whereby he says there was a composition entered into in terms of the insolvency act i think it's section 129 of the insolvency act and the property has now been uh, reallocated to Sansa, and Sansa is now entitled to the property as if he had taken formal transfer. This is also a type of transfer by endorsement, if you understand what I mean. But the deeds office doesn't regard it as a transfer by endorsement. Section 68.1, the lapsing of a personal servitude. This, is, this has been asked so many times in the past, and they specifically ask you uh, when a personal servitude and remember, personal servitude, we, we, we differentiate between a personal servitude, a, a positive personal servitude, which is the usufruct, uses habitatio, and negative personal servitudes, which is actually a veto right. Um, but this is the section 681 has been extended to include preemptive rights, reversionary rights, fidicomissary rights, all those rights also fall under section 68.1. Now section 68.1 says that if a personal servitude has lapsed for any reason whatsoever, the holder of the title deed or anybody on his behalf can apply to the register of deeds 
for the noting of the lapsing thereof against the title deed. And the title deed of the right must be lodged if available. So it's not necessary to lodge it if available. So if any condition in a deed, which is not a condition of a condition which is enforceable by the community at large, but it is a personal servitude in favor of a person, has lapsed by a fluxion of time, by the death of the person, by um, the, that it has, let us say that it has served its time. That's actually the, 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 the criteria. If any personal servitude has served its time, then you obviously bring an application for the cancellation thereof. The drafting of that should be no problem. However, a servitude can also lapse, a personal servitude can also lapse by, please put off your mic, please put off your mic, your mic off. Please put off your mic, sir. So could you please put off your mic? So so can you put off your mic, please? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to continue while his mic is on. Um, while we're speaking about Section 68.1, remember Section 68.1, if the servitude has served its time, it lapses. But it can also be cancelled by a unilateral waiver thereof. So let's say it's a usufruct in favor of, of, of somebody and that I don't want this usufruct anymore. And he waives it unilaterally. Then that will also be tantamount to a cancellation in terms of section 68.1. But if it is an agreement between the bare dominium owner and the holder of the servitude, it cannot be done in terms of section 68.1. Then you must cancel it in terms of section 68.2 by virtue of a notarial deed. That you will be drafting when you do your notarial exam, which I hope is the day after that you're writing this paper. So once again, Note on the difference between section 68.1 and 68.2. 68.2 is an agreement. 68.1 is lapsing because it served its time or unilateral. And Afrikaans praat ons van afstand or uh, I speak about unilateral cancellation or waiver. And But if I'm unilaterally waiving my right, what does that, what effect does that have on my value of my property. And, and, and why I'm asking this question, because they're going to ask you, what are the transfer implications for a section 68.1 lapsing of a personal servitude that served its time or that has been waived? What are, what are, the, what are the transfer duty implications? If the servitude has served its time, there's no value enhancement of the property, so there's no transfer duty implication. But if the use of waives that right, then a value must be placed on the enhancement of the property. And that is calculated, they won't ask you this, but that is calculated in terms of the Estate Duty Act. And then transfer duty will be payable on that amount. So you'll have to lodge a transfer duty receipt with your application in terms of section 681, which is accompanied by the title deed, as well as this waiver or cancellation, the unilateral cancellation, and then um, the noting thereof against the title deed. So we've done 174253 44 58 to 681. Last one, 93 1. The application and affidavit for the change of name. Now, since the 1st of May 2011, the Section 93 is also applicable to companies that has changed their names because in, in terms of the old Companies Act of 1971, there was a section 44. That section was not carried over into the new 
Companies Act of 2008. And for that reason, they had to amend Section uh, 93 to also provide for the change of name of a company. So now Section 93.1 does not only refer to natural persons, first names and, sec and surnames, or churches or partnerships, but it also refers to companies, close corporations, juristic persons that have changed their name. This application in terms of Section 93 will also be in the form of an affidavit because there you have to declare under oath that this change of name will not have the effect of a change of persona because it's easy if, they, if there's, uh, you know, in the past, if there was an Alan West uh, with, an, with, an, uh, uh, with a different name and I just changed my name, but I got the same date of birth, then we could transfer the property just by an application in terms of Section 93.1. So there cannot be a change of persona. Um, as I said, if you're changing your surname, just let me go one step back. A woman has the divine right to change her surname at will. If she gets married, she can retain her maiden name, she can assume her uh, uh, husband's name, or she can take on a double barrel surname. Um, she doesn't have to do that legally. She assumes it as such. That is in terms of the provisions of the Birth Death Registration Act. I think it's the Section 23 of the Birth Death Registration Act. But the man, is st I'm stuck with West for the rest of my life, unless I go through the formal process of advertising to change it to East. But we're not going to go down that way. So once again, I'm saying 93 is for natural persons to change first names or surnames, not a woman, but nothing prevents a woman if she wants to update her title deed for a new surname to do it in terms of Section 93.1, but it is not per entry. It is not obligatory. It is optional. Let's say she has a, assumed her husband's name or she has assumed a double barrel surname and she's transferring the property. She will use a new surname and just in brackets you will say formally so-and-so. But that will only be in when she's transferring, never when she's acquiring. When she's acquiring, the surname will be as at date of registration. So once again, you have to ask your client before you execute that deed. Didn't you get married? Didn't you change your surname? Because if you did, I have to do a 41B later, if you understand what I mean. Oh, I must amend it now. So section 93, and, and, and I, I'm getting this feeling again. I don't know why getting this feeling that I'm going to spot Section 93. I can't remember when last Section 93 has come up in the exams. So I'm spotting Section 93 for this exam. Um, then we come to sundry applications for endorsements of immovable property or mortgage bonds. And then we're looking at 39.2, 39.3 and 40 of the Administration of Estates Act. Now, Section 39.2, once again, Yes, it comes up in, 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 as I said, in more than 40 years, I, I think I've seen it once. And this is the, this, and, and I can only explain Section 39.2 of the Administration of the States Act in the form of a scenario. I die and I say, my property must, my wife will have the usufruct over my property for her lifetime. After her death, the property must be sold and the proceeds must be divided amongst my children living at that point in time. Now my executor sits with a problem. He must wind up this estate. Can he, to whom must he transfer the property? Can, he tr can you transfer the property to a use of fracturing? No, because it's a real right. You cannot transfer the property to the use of fracturing. Can he transfer it to the children Subject to the UCIFRA? No, because we don't know how many of them are going to be alive and, and only the proceeds must go to them. So you're going to bring an application in terms of Section 39.2 of the Deeds Registry, ah, the Administration of Estates Act, where you're going to have the executor apply to the Registrar of Deeds for endorsement of this property held by that title in terms of Section 39.2 of the Deeds Registry Act to endorse the terms of the will 
dictated so and so against signed. As easy as that. So once again, I'm saying it's not rocket science to prepare this application. You must know what circumstances must prevail for you to be able to bring this application. Then the 39.3 also, I, I, I think I've seen it once or twice in the 44 years. This is the case where I bequeath my property to my wife, but my estate cannot afford to procure transfer of it. And, she, and, and the executor wants to wind up this estate, but there's no money to pay the conveyancer. So then all that happens, they call it undue hardship, that the property will be endorsed in terms of section 39.3 to endorse the terms of the will against the property. When the heir has sufficient funds to procure the transfer, the, a new executor will be appointed if this executor is no longer alive and the property will be transferred to the person entitled there to. So that application and the application 39.2, the only difference is the section. Look at the supporting documents that you're going to lodge with that as well. These sections have come up in the past. Um, as I said, it is, it is the exception to the rule. The one that's more or less the rule is section 40. Once again, I get a feeling I will, I will, I will be able to prepare a application in terms of section 40. And section 40 is once again per entry. If I have got a testamentary trust, also known as a mortis causa trust, and I die, and I say my property must be administered by my trustees until my youngest child reaches the age of 28. Remember, the estate must be wound up. My youngest child is only 12 now. Now, for another 16 years, he cannot wind up this estate, so he's going to bring an application in terms of Section 40 to endorse the terms of the will, dated so-and-so of the deceased against the title deed of the property. Yes, you're going to lodge the will. Yes, you're going to lodge the application. Yes, you're going to lodge the title deed. Are you going to lodge a transfer duty receipt? There's no transfer duty payable, but the registrar said there's possibly that payable. So either they will note a caveat or you will get a VAT clearance. Not a VAT clearance, a transfer duty receipt, which says, now, guys, in practice, you know, after 16 years to go and determine whether I was VAT uh, registered or not, it's going to have a major problem. So rather get the transfer duty exemption. Are you going to lodge a rights clearance certificate? No, why not? It's not a transfer. You're not transferring the property. This is merely a caveat as such, noted against the title deed. If they mortgage bonds over this property, do you think you lodge the bonds for disposal? No, it's not a transfer. So you don't have to lodge the bonds for disposal. So once again, with all these sundry applications that we looked at, uh, sorry, the last one, there was the change of name of a company, close corporation, and the conversion thereof. Yeah. I, I refer you and I want you to study this very well. Chief Registrar Circular 28 of 2013. That will tell you what documents you're going to lodge for the conversion of a company, you know, private company, public company, or from a close corporation to a company. You cannot convert from a company to a close corporation anymore because close corporations have ceased to be after the New Companies Act. So there I refer you to Chief Registrar Circular 28 of 2013. Guys, then we come, and as I said, I'm sorry, I am, I am going very quickly now, but it is necessary that we get through the curriculum. So the next aspect we're going to look at is, sorry, I, I've done all these now, the, the 39, 2, the 17, 4, the 25, 3, the 43, the 68, 1, the application terms of section 39, 2, that I've done, the supporting documents I've done, and uh, the, how to prepare it, that I've done. Now we come to certificates of title. Here I want to say to you, for every certificate of title, there's a prescribed form. So very seldom, they're going to ask you to prepare a certificate of title. But you must know under what circumstances, what certificate of title is going to be required and which section applies there. To. 
The one that I'm getting, a, and I don't know why, the one I'm getting a feeling about again is the consolidated type. Because there you must know how to prepare, the, although you got the form, you must know how to prepare the extending clause and how to qualify the conditions, etc., etc. So once again, I'm saying with a consolidated title, I will, I will be very hesitant to tell you not to know how to prepare the application and the consolidated title and how, how to deal with the mortgage bonds. The other certificates of title, I don't think so much that you must know how to prepare the certificate of title, but know how to prepare the application under what section. So let us look at the different sections now. Section 34.1 and 34.1a. And here, this usually comes in your short question paper. Because section 34.1 and 34.1a makes it obligatory for you to take out a certificate of registered title when you are the joint owner of a piece of property under the same title deed. By way of an example, you and I, half share, half share, one title deed. And I want to mortgage my share now. Um, I can't mortgage my share and give the bank your title deed. So therefore, I must first take out the certificate of registered title in terms of section 34.1. But now remember, it's a certificate of title for an undivided share, but the application is in terms of section 37.1. But it is for the issue of a certificate of registered title for a certificate of registered title in terms of section 34.1. So that's why I say, you cannot, if you're going to put in your heading, application for a certificate of registered title in terms of section 34.1. You're wrong. Because it's an application in terms of section 37.1 for the issue of a certificate of registered title. That's why in your heading you just put application. Then you can't be wrong. But now you know it's 34.1 or 34.1a and you know that it's for an half share. So once again you're going to say I. First of all, preparation clause, Joe Soap, 007, application, test, identity number status, do hereby apply to the register of deeds at Pretoria to the, for the issue to me of a certificate of registered title in respect of one of words and figures of earth so-and-so, township so-and-so, province so-and-so, measuring so-and-so, held by deed of transfer, signed. That's your application. So you, you know that it was 34.1 or 34.1a? No problem. And you know that it, it's obligatory if I'm going to mortgage it or I'm going to sell a fraction of my share. Because I cannot sell a fraction of my share of a joint title because whose fraction is it then? If you understand what I mean? Because you and I have got both a half share. Now I'm selling a quarter share. Which quarter share is this? Of whose quarter share is this? So that's why I also have to take out a certificate of registered title. Section 34.2. And this has never been asked. But... I very much doubt if it is going to be asked now, because remember, I think Anton said to you the week before last, 34.2, you also have to advertise now in terms of regulation 68.1 capital E, because it is for a application for a lost deed. So, so the scenario that, that is present here is you and I are joint owners of a piece of property, but our title deed is lost. So what do we have to do under normal circumstances? We have to apply for a certified copy in terms of regulation 68.1. To do that, I must advertise in a newspaper. Am I right? And it must lay open for two weeks and only then I can apply. Here they say, both of us do not have to apply. I can apply for a certificate of registered title in terms of section 34.2, but the chief registrar of deeds says, before I can do that, I must first advertise. So. Can you see, I, I, I very much doubt if they're going to ask this. If they do ask this, it's going to be an unfair question unless you, because that section C, uh, regulation 68.1E is not in your new book yet. 35 comes often. This is where you are the owner of a property, but you hold the property in different shares. For instance, just to make it simple, you and I were of the property and I bought your share. That means I own 
one half share by virtue of the title deed where we bought it together and the other half share by the transfer that you gave to me. So I've got two title deeds. But I don't want two title deeds. I want one title deed. Then it's not obligatory. It's once again not obligatory. You And they've asked this in the past and, and you must see how the people draft this application and the 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 the, the um the amalgamation of the shares, how they how they set out the shares. Let's say half share, half share, and now I'm the owner of the full property. Once again, heading is going to be application. I, Alan West, identity number status, the year by apply to the register of deeds, the issue of me of a certificate of register title in terms of section 35 in respect of this property, held half share by that title deed, half share by that title deed signed. If it's not, to, if I, I want to amalgamate my Let's say I'm, I've got one eighth share and one quarter share and a third share. Now that makes, let us say it makes five eighth share, just as an example. Then I would say apply to the register of deeds for the issue of a certificate of registered title in terms of, in respect of five eighth share in the following property so and so held this share by that title, this share by that, this share by that title signed. And th that question was asked for 15 marks, guys, 15 marks. And I know and I saw that the majority of the people got naught because if you cannot identify the section and you cannot identify that those shares make five eight shares and you don't put five eight shares in it, you're not going to get your marks. Okay, that's 35. 36 is the section whereby you are holding different properties under different paragraphs under one title deed. For instance, I buy, I go to, I go to my developer and I say to him, I want to buy six of your urban in this township. And he gives me one title deed, paragraph one for one, two, three, four, five, six, with each of its own conditions in. And now I want to mortgage one of those properties. Yes, I can give the bond the bank, the whole title deed, I can. They'll love it. But then I'm stuck because I can't deal with the other properties. So then I'll take out, it's not obligatory, but I'll take out the certificate of register title in terms of section 36 for one of those properties or for four of those properties and give him the title of the other property or whatever the case may be. Once again, it's an application in terms of section 37, but you're not going to worry about that. It's application, apply, in respect of that title. The only thing that you should know, and this comes once again in your short questions, that you cannot exhaust your title deed by the issuing of certificates of registered title in terms of section 36. You, you cannot, and, and I hate using this word, you cannot kill your title deed by issuing certificates. There always has to be one property left under the title deed in terms of section 36. The same with section 34.2. If you and I lost our title deed and I take out a certificate of registered title and you the sole owner of the half share under that other title deed, you cannot use 34.2. Then you have to use 68.1. Okay? 38. Um, 38 hasn't been asked in the past because it's difficult to, to raise a question, a long question on 38 because 38 means that the deeds office copy and the client's copy is lost. I always refer to the year 2007. Guys, if you're in practice and your client comes to you and he says his title was registered or his anti-nuptial contract or his servitude or his lease agreement was registered in 2007, you get goose pimples. Because in 2007, the Registrar of Deeds in Pretoria lost 400,000 images. And that means if you go to the deeds office and you want to get a copy of a title deed, they say to you, sorry, there's no record of this title deed. That means you have to procure a new title deed on the history. It has to be advertised in the government gazette. It has to be advertised in the newspaper. It has to lie open for inspection for six weeks. Thereafter, you lodge that at the deeds office and a new title deed is procured. So once again, with section 38, I think you must just know the short questions around that because they'll never be able to ask you to procure a new title deed. Yes, for the advert and the application, there's prescribed forms in the Deeds Registries Act, but you've got that with you as such. 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.1, 39.
is an error in registration. What I mean by an error in registration is the same property has been registered in two different person's names. I go to my I go to the developer and I say I want this if and he transfers that if to me as if one. My colleague goes and they transfer. She says I want if two, but they also transfer if one to her. Why can't she just rectify it in terms of um, section 41B? Because that will be a transfer of a real right. So what she must do is she must transfer if one to me. I have if one by two title deeds then. Lovely, I mortgage one with the one bank and one with the other bank. The register of these, as soon as that happens, will tell you, mm -mm, you must now apply for a certificate of registered title in terms of section 39.1 to give you one title deed for this property, which was held by that deed of transfer and that deed of transfer. So once again, just let's think how this application is going to read. Preparation clause, heading, also 37, the other Alan West, Ident number status, the hereby apply to the register of deeds for a certificate of registered title in terms of section 39.1 in respect of this property held by that deed of transfer and that deed of transfer. 35.1 would have been that share and that share. Now it's just that title deed and that title deed because it's the whole property. Shouldn't be a problem. 39.2. Also, one that if you really desperate for money you tell your client if you got a title deed with many mortgage bonds that have been cancelled and remember in before 1994 we used to have the group areas act and your group is still inserted in your title deed as an indian group or a malay group or a colored group and there's a, 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 a condition in that this property may not be transferred to anybody but white people and you want your title deed free from all this you can apply to the register of deeds for a certificate of title in respect of the lapsed conditions. What does that mean? All that I'm going to do is I'm going to apply to the Register of Deeds once again in terms of Section 37 for a certificate of registered title in terms of Section 392 in respect of the following property. And that certificate of registered title will just be free from all those lapsed conditions. But that's if you want it. And really, if you're that desperate for money, go for it. Section 40, and I told you, once again, I get a feeling. And uh, Section 40 comes up often in the exams, and they usually ask you to draft the application and the Certificate of Consolidated Title. Guys, the application, and I, for the life of me, and I've seen this, I promise you, I've seen and I can show you old exam papers where the candidate drafts the application and brings in all the conditions and the reference to the mortgage bonds in the application. The application is a simple application. And please write this down. In the top right hand corner, prepared by me, conveyancer, JOPO 007. Heading, application. Who brings the application? I, Alan West, identity number status. Do hereby apply to the Register of Deeds for the issue to me of a Certificate of Consolidated Title Deed in respect of this property held by that title and this property held by that title, which have been consolidated to form this property as will more fully appear from the diagram signed. That's all that you put in your application. That's all. So what are you saying? You apply for a certificate of consolidated title in respect of this component, full property description, that component, full property description and title, which have been consolidated to form this property as one full property. And where will you get the property description of your consolidated property? Where, where does this new property description come from? They will usually give you a diagram or they'll tell you that the property description on your consolidated diagram is this. And then, as will more fully appear from the diagram, sign. No conditions, no reference to mortgage bonds, nothing. That's all. And that's 10 marks. That's 10 marks that you should get, and, and you should be able to blindfold write this. Then you must draft your consolidated title. You know that it's prescribed form O. 
Yes, you leave the upper half blank or you put an asterisk there and you say certificate and you, but I, well, I, as I said in the past, they gave you the title deed and they said to you to prepare the consolidated title, but people do not know who the owner of the property is in the title deed. They use the former transfer law to bring the application. So you must be able to identify who the owner of the property who, in, to, to see who's going to consolidate the property. Just a few tips with your consolidated title. When you are disclosing that um, you apply for the consolidated of this property and this property, you do not put in the extent there. You can put in the extent in your application, but not in your description of your components. When you are drafting your property description and your extending clause, your extending clause of a certificate of consolidated title will take on what form? Think again, what form will your extending clause of a certificate of consolidated title? Remember, consolidated title is a new entity, am I right? Mm -hmm. So it will be, you're right, it will be a TT, but it will be the second the second form of a TT and the second form of a TT is without the holding deed because you've already referred to the holding deed. And then we come to the qualification of conditions. Now I've spoken to Anton and I've spoken to the Register of Deeds and I've spoken to the um, training officer of the Register of Deeds and I've spoken to the Assistant Registrar and I said to them, do we need and, and Audrey loves using this word to find commonality conditions. Or can I just, let, let me first say, if all the components are subject to the, all the same conditions, there's no qualification. You just can't just say subject to the following conditions, A, B, C, D. If you have two components, which has some conditions which are common to both components, but some conditions not common to both conditions, to all the conditions, you can say the former of so-and-so indicated by the figure so-and-so on diagram so-and-so is subject to A, B, C, D. And the other one, the former of so-and-so is subject to E, A, B, D, E. Even though there are commonality, what they actually would, would have liked you to do is to say the whole earth is subject to these and the, this is subject to that and this is subject to that. It is so confusing when you're going to subdivide in a later. So therefore I say, and it will not be marked incorrect because I've discussed it with Anton and the registrar. If you say the former earth science is subject to A, B, C, D and the former earth science is subject to B, D, E, F, although B is the same and the first component as in the second component and you've repeated it, there's no problem with that. But as soon as you go try looking for commonality and you remember you're under enormous pressure while you're writing this exam and now you must find out if B is also applicable there, just bring, and remember, don't try and write out all the conditions. Say B, I would have quoted the condition. C, I would have quoted the condition, and then you do, then you're not going to lose time. Okay. So, guys, with a certificate of consolidated title, you should not have a problem. But the mortgage bonds is the problem. And yeah, and yeah, I get this feeling again. The difference between section 40 in brackets three, and the difference between 40 in brackets 5a. When are you going to substitute the mortgage bonds in terms of section 40 in brackets 3? And when are you going to substitute it in terms of 40 in brackets 5a? Now, 40 in brackets 3 is if the same mortgage bond is registered over all the components. I'm, I'm, I'm consolidating ERF 1 with ERF 2. And a mortgage bond in favor of APSA, the same mortgage bond is over 1 and 2. Then all that APSA is going to do is going to give a consent. MM, you're going to use MM. Hereby consent to the, with an, 
and the operative clause do hereby consent to the issue of a certificate of consolidated title in respect of Earth 1 and Earth 2, now known as Earth 3. That's it. That's MM. However, if your mortgage, if your only one component is subject to a mortgage bond, you cannot use MM because there's new property being brought in to the mortgage bond. Then you have to use WW, which is an application and a consent, almost like 57. It's an application and consent. But I usually, it's, it's, it's MM for the 43, and then you just turn MM around and it becomes WW for the 45A. That's if all the components are not subject to the same mortgage bond. That shouldn't be a problem. If all the components are different to different mortgage bonds, what are you going to do? Let us say Earth 1 is subject to a mortgage bond in favor of APSA, and Earth 2 is subject to a mortgage bond in favor of First National Bond. What are you going to do? What does the Act say? 40 in brackets 5 in brackets B says the bonds must be cancelled. However, there is a other way around it. We are only cancelling one bond and, and substituting, provided you got enough money to pay the other guy off, if you understand what I mean. So there is a way of getting around it, but who are you going to pay and who are you going to cancel? That's why they say cancel and register a new bond or new bonds or whatever the case may be. So that is our certificate of consolidated title, our application. We know how to, we don't put in the extents. We know how to draft the extending clause. We know how to draft the conditional clause. You know, people, what is difficult about a certificate of consolidated title? You should, it's usually for 40 marks, 40 for the consolidated, 10 for the application. If you don't get 45 out of 50, I don't know, then you're not a conveyance. You cannot be a conveyance. Mm -hmm. Section 43, and this is once again where we come to, to the qualification of conditions and the plotting of conditions. Now, Section 43, and you will note that Section 43 is a yeah, 43.5 of our deeds, 43.5 of our deeds registry access. If you want to deal separately with a portion of property, you must first take out a certificate of registered title. For instance, I want to transfer, I have an earth, let's call it earth one, and I want to transfer a, the remainder of my earth to Anton Tron. How am I going to create the remainder? I must first take out a certificate of register title for a portion, let's call it portion one, and then the remainder, and then I can transfer the remainder to Anton. When I take out a certificate of register title for portion one, it's an application. It's an application in terms of section 43.1. So your heading is going to be application. I, Alan West, hereby apply to the register of deeds for the issue to me of a certificate of register title in terms of section 43.1 in respect of Portion one of Earth so and so as will more fully appear from diagram. No conditions, nothing in your application. Okay, remember that. No conditions, nothing in your application. And then you've got the prescribed form R for the certificate of register title. They're not going to ask you to draft the whole prescribed form R. They might say that prescribed form R is subject to the following conditions, and here's a diagram. Now you have to plot and determine which conditions apply to this property by reason of situation, situation or by virtue of ancillary rights. Now, once again, time that does just not allow me to go through the whole aspect of plotting and qualification of conditions when doing a subdivision. In your notes that 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 uh, uh, um, lead has given you, They've actually taken an extract out of my book, which they never paid me for. Um, in my book, it's got the exact same, and I give you different scenarios of when there's ancillary rights, when it's subject by virtue of situation, when it's not subject by virtue of situation. So please go and look at that for purposes of um, the qualification and plotting of conditions. The last certificate of registered title is section 46. This is the certificate of registered title for a township title. It is exactly the same as section 43. It's just your property description that changes. So you're applying for a certificate of registered title in respect of 
the farm so and so now known as the township sun city that's all what can they ask you about townships in the exams very little they can only ask you to prepare this application for the certificate of registered title or the bond holders consent remember every province has a different spluma and bylaw and things that's applicable to that so possibly in 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 the in the in the oral they can ask you a lot about spluma but here very little can be asked about spluma guys and that i think brings us to the end of certificates of title and we're going to then next week do sectional title law we're going to go through all the sections but you know what makes sectional title law so easy everything there's a prescribed form for except the 15b3 certificate the 113b certificate and uh the schedule of conditions so um we're going to look at that and we're going to discuss all the aspects surrounding sectional titles and then we're going to look at the syllabus again and i've just asked anton if you'll bear with us for another 15 to 20 minutes next wednesday just to take you through a few aspects as well and then to wish you well for the exams so guys it is now almost quarter to four the floor is now open for questions again i urge you then to ask questions anything that you want to know regarding the aspects that we've dealt with today if anything was unclear please let us elaborate on that you've got 15 minutes the floor is yours okay the question was asked regarding your the, the waiver of your legal exceptions in your mortgage bond the non numerati pecuniae the de dubious bel pluribus raised the bender the non causa debitae the error calculi must i know that no in, in actual fact in terms of the uh, consumer protection act that has been repealed in any case so you don't have to worry about your waiver of your legal exceptions or what the mean you'll see in old exam papers there was asked what is what is these legal exceptions and when will they apply mm -hmm. that's not applicable anymore so don't study that for the exams so the you do not bring it into your mortgage bond neither questions i can't believe that there are no questions hi yes First name? Oh, sorry, it's Trishal Sharma. Yes, Mr. Sharma. Hi, I just wanted to find out there were questions in previous exam papers regarding without prejudice clause that's supposed to be drafted in the bond. Yes. However, I have absolutely no clue as to what that means. Please, could you enlighten us? That, that is the aspect. If I'm registering a second mortgage bond, and the first mortgage bond was in favor of, of, of one financial institution. And then you must include a non-prejudice clause. But um, Mr. Sharma, and, and obviously in practice, it is important that you do know that. But I, can I tell you, please don't, unless you're going for the book prize, don't try that, okay? Or don't, don't, don't waste your time on that. You've got, you got better things to waste your time on now. Thank you. Mr. West, can I ask? Uh, can I ask something? My my name is Marushka. Yes, Marushka. I've, I've got two general questions, which is just for drafting purposes. I was going through some old question papers. The one was where in the question they actually gave the they gave the they say they said basically the person was born on a certain date, say so 17 April 1990, and then you have to describe the person. So in the answer, they actually had the identity number and born on, which is a bit confusing to me. That, Shouldn't we just that, use the identity number? Sorry, that's absolutely incorrect. Um, you, you'll, you'll note that regulation 18 of our deeds registries act says, if the identity number is incorrect, but, but I do have an identity number, then you will describe me in my deed with an identity number and a date of birth. But 
um, I, that, that, that memo is incorrect. It is either, remember, I'm born with an identity number, okay? So it will only be the identity number. Okay, great. And then the second question was, if you uh, describing the transferee, um, in the power of attorney, we just put the transferee's name, for instance, and then uh, we don't use the other words like in the deed of transfer where you've, it's sort of part of the vesting where you say, uh, he's a is executive no, administrator. Absolutely not. Yeah, you just don't put that. You just say Alan West identity number status, not his is executive administrators or signs. Yeah. Um, so if you let, let let's say Lerishka, you did it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be wrong, but but you're going to run out of time. Mm. Okay. Thanks. And then the last question was regarding um the last deeds and regulation sixty eight. I know the previous way of doing it and in a new way. What does it mean that Mr. Uh, Toron was saying we don't, we, we, they can't put it in there? I'm just a bit confused as to what do we actually study with regards to Regulation 68? Should we study as, the as, new way or they can't ask us? Or As I understand it, and I just want you, you, I want you again to ask him to elaborate on it next week. But as sure. I understand it, the, the act that you're going to get hasn't got the updated regulation 61 cap, uh, cap, 68 1 capital E mm. in it. Therefore, they cannot ask a question on it. So he said that they won't ask a question on the amended regulation because the act is not updated with it. Okay, so but I'll ask him next next week. Yes, but please, do you think they I, might? I've made, a, yeah. I've made a note. I'll also I'll also ask him. Okay, great. That's everything. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Guys, if there are no further questions, it's now up to you. Remember, we've finished with, with, with conventional deeds now, so you must be able to prepare all your conventional deeds, mortgage bonds, consents, applications, certificates of registered title, powers of attorney, etc., etc. While I'm speaking about the power of attorney, remember the possibility is going to exist that you're going to get the sectional title power of attorney. Where are you going to get your property description? Because, you know, it says an undivided share and all that. Where are you going to get that from? from your prescribed form Z, or you, you got your prescribed form, so don't try and, and, and memorize the property description of a sectional title unit. It is in your sectional title act, in the forms. It will be there, so you will just rewrite it from that. People uh, make grave mistakes that they don't describe a sectional title unit correctly. Because it is, is the section together with an undivided share in the common property allocated to it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that you will get in your in your prescribed form. Uh, last question, Trishal. No, no, we still got more time. Oh, okay. Uh, very quickly, in terms of the um, the sixty-eight one, if the Yusufak tree has passed away, um, do we just lodge? the death certificate or do we still have to do the 68-1 uh, which i'm assuming will have to be then done by the executor no remember regular uh, section 68-1 says if a personal servitude has lapsed for any reason whatsoever the holder of the title deed can apply to the register of deeds so the owner of that title deed will apply to the register of deeds and uh, the owner will provide or you the conveyancer will provide the necessary proof that the guy died in the form of a death notice or death certificate, or whatever the case may be. We have had many problems in the past that, you know, the executor died 50 years ago and they, got the, the, they can't find the death certificate and they can't find the death notice. And they, they came to the chief register of these and they said, can we give you a photo of the uh, uh, tombstone? Uh, we don't accept the, the uh, photo of the tombstone. However, we do accept, the, the conference said they will accept an affidavit from any related party to say that that person has passed away. Because in certain instances, you just can't find proof that the guy has passed away. But a, a photo of a tombstone, no. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, it was just, just with regards to a transfer that I'm just 
doing at the moment and uh, the, but then I'm, this, I'm now i must charge you for this because this yeah is you not... should charge me and, <laughs> and and now i feel like an idiot because i haven't lodged a 68 one i just lodged the uh death you, certificate you're going to as... get a horrible r <laughs> <laughs> lucky lucky it was only sent up yesterday so <laughs> i got till tomorrow to sort everything out <laughs> thanks <laughs> welcome okay guys i think that was most probably the last question i'm going to bid you farewell and as i said you've now got a week to cover all your conventional deeds and ask questions and as I said, we're going to do sectional titles and the the, the, the the acts next week. I bid you farewell. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye bye. Uh, welcome to our third session of the